Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Anarchic Visibility, a discussion around the lasting impact of the groundbreaking collective Godzilla, um, in conjunction with the publication of the anthology edited by Howie Chen and published by Primary Information. Um, I'm Lisa Gold, A4's Executive Director, and a quick accessibility check. I am a Hapa, half Korean, half white woman with um, my hair pulled up in a top knot, wearing a black turtleneck sweater, uh, sitting in a very dark room. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight to hear from our brilliant uh, speakers. Uh, Howie Chen and Simon Wu, and hopefully um, a few members of Godzilla who are here tonight and will participate in the Q&A. Um, when Howie reached out to me a few months ago to access the A4 archives while he was conducting research for this anthology, I, I just immediately knew that we wanted to be involved in some way to help further the discourse um, around this really important um, marker in our community's history. And as Howie stated in his opening essay, discourse and power are mutually constitutive and determining who is legible and visible in the art world. And I'd like to posit that that idea extends well beyond just the art world. And I'm really grateful to Howie for putting together this anthology, putting it into the universe um, to further bolster our visibility and our power. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with A4 and are just joining us because you're super fans of Howie or Simon or Godzilla or primary information, um, I want you to know that A4 is a 38-year-old nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to ensuring greater representation, equity, and opportunities for Asian American artists and arts organizations. And we, um, we offer professional development, workshops, conversations, community building events uh, around Asian American identity and issues, and we're the only service organization in the country dedicated to the professional development of Asian American artists across all disciplines. Um, so a few things before we get started and I introduce our panelists, I just want to let you know that this event is being recorded for our YouTube and Facebook channels and we'll be posting it shortly. Um, and then at the end of the discussion between Howie and Simon, we'll open up the floor for your questions so you can um, type them in the Q&A box which you can launch from the icon labeled Q&A, how convenient, at the bottom of your Zoom screen menu. Or you can send a message to us uh, by the chat function and we'll share, the, um, we'll share your question. Um, we also have closed captioning available via Rev. So if you'd like to enable the captions, you should see a CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen menu um, that has uh, the words live transcript uh, below it. So you can click on that icon to enable the captions. Um, and now just a, a few quick announcements and then I will make a land acknowledgement. Um, the first announcement, unfortunately, is quite sad, uh, but I want to take a moment to um, share news of the passing of Naini Chen, uh, the founder of Naini Chen Dance Company. Um, if For those of you who have not heard, um, she was just an amazing, incredible advocate for AAPI creators and just a really important voice in um, the dance community and in the arts community. And my heart, all of us, we it goes out to um, Nani's family and the entire uh, company there. So if you want more information, you can um, email me later. Um, I also wanna thank um, Priscilla Sun, our programs and communications manager uh, for helping organize tonight's event, as well as Hiji Nam and James Hoff of Primary Information, the publishers of this anthology, um, not only for supporting the project, but for also donating a catalog for one lucky attendant here tonight. Um, the only catch is that you have to come to A4 to pick it up. So we will draw names um, from the list of participants here tonight. So if you're using a fake name for Zoom, um, please consider renaming yourself. Um, and we'll announce the winner uh, after Howie and Simon's conversation. Um, and if you don't win and you want a copy of the anthology, you can purchase one through the link um, that Priscilla will share. Uh, I'm also another link that we're going to um, share. We're going to ask you to just do us a favor and fill out the post event survey because we're always trying to improve and shape our programs to be more relevant. So we really value your input and we can ask you just, it's like five questions. It's super fast. Just fill it out. Seriously, it only takes a couple minutes. So that means a lot to us. Um, we'll share the link for that one too. Um, but no more programs until January's town hall. Announcements are relatively short tonight. Um, we're, we're taking a week-long break starting next Friday. So um, 
we're going to enjoy the holidays. We hope you do too. So check your next A4 newsletter for um, details on future programs. So um, thank you, as always, to all of our incredible supporters who make these programs possible and allow us just to exist. Um, our, our friends at Capital One, Con Edison, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, in partnership with the City Council, uh, the New York State Council on the Arts, with the support of Gap Governor Kathy Hochul and the New York State Legislature, um, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, Fiskars, the Teeger Foundation, the Howard Gilman Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, and so many other generous individuals who make all of our programs possible. Um, and if you want to be among those uh, generous supporters, you can. Uh, you can text A4 donate to 202-858-1233. You can pay with Venmo, Apple Pay, credit card, or um, you know, it's the end of the year. We have a, like a very, very modest goal of five thousand dollars to raise for um, this year's campaign. We're only sixty percent there, so consider a tax deductible donation of uh, some Bitcoin or um, <laughs> just send us some love. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, okay, so now in uh, uh, a land acknowledgement, so in uh, the before times, we would be meeting in the A4 offices on the unceded lands of the, Lon the Lenape and Canarsie peoples. Um, but since we're meeting virtually, I'd like to share a digital land acknowledgement written by Canadian theater artist Adrian Wong, as we're all occupying different physical spaces. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We're using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art that we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to, a changing, contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good use of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. So now I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, I'm going to read very, very, very abbreviated bios because I've gone on too long already, um, and you can read more about them on our website. Um, Howie Chen is a New York-based curator engaged in collaborative art production and research, a founding director of Chen's Townhouse Gallery in Brooklyn. Howie's held curatorial roles at the Whitney Museum of American Art and MoMA PS1, and his writings have been published in places uh, too numerous to mention here. Um, Simon Wu is a writer and curator based across Brooklyn and Philadelphia. He currently serves um, as a curator and program coordinator with the Racial Imaginary Institute and in, is an alum of the Whitney Independent Study Program and uh, was the recipient of A4's 2018 Van Leer Fellowship in Visual Arts Curation. I will now turn it over to Howie and Simon. Oh, well, wow. okay. Um, thank you, Lisa, for the kind introduction. Um, I have a, a bunch of thank yous. Um, Thank you for uh, to the Asian American Arts Alliance for hosting this event. Um, it's nice to bring this conversation full circle to A4, given its history in supporting Asian American arts and also its role as a fiscal sponsor for Godzilla, which is a crucial thing because Godzilla never applied for a nonprofit status for both practical and ideological reasons. A4 made it possible for donations and grant mon monies to flow through to Godzilla to support its programs and activities. For, for those who don't know the vagaries of the nonprofit um, world, fiscal sponsors are the bread and butter of the nonprofit world, especially for um, budding smaller nonprofits um, to be able to um, fundraise and, and um, to just keep things going. Um, I also want to thank uh, Primary Information and the team there for publishing the book and the visionary support of James Hoff, who is the founder there for giving Godzilla and Godzilla's history a platform in the print world. And I also want to thank Ella for the amazing design of the anthology and making the material communicate with readers. And there were thousands of, of um, scans and pages of things, and they, they really made sense of it visually and organizationally. Um, so I, I can't um, stress how important designers and publishers and everything is to, to the effort. Um, and of course, I'm grateful to all the Godzilla members who were so generous with their time and archives when I called up. Um, uh, we. 
you know, they helped out with this anthology in so many ways to make it as complete as possible so that it can make it into your hands. Um, I appreciate the trust that they put in me to articulate Godzilla's history um, through all the rich and meaningful material that they, they had in their hands. Um, it's great to see many of the Godzilla members on this call, and I'm looking forward to hearing their voices and be in dialogue with, with them. Um, and for context, I've known Simon, um, Simon Wu here um, for a number of years, and I've enjoyed following his curatorial work and, and writings, and I'm looking forward to the, our chat today. Um, we, we talked about this um, briefly before, beforehand. We'll be discussing the Godzilla book um, and then um, kind of moving through the group's legacy and linking those issues to the present. Um, I also will be asking Simon about his recent curatorial projects um, and research and finally opening it up to talk to the audience members for questions and responses. I kind of, I think we both agree that we wanted to um, increase the Q&A and talk back and session more so um we're just that's the kind of flight plan for for this evening so I'll, I'll throw it to simon um just to get things started yeah um thank you howie and thank you lisa for the introduction and um i'm happy to be here today um excited to talk to howie about this really great project um and i figure we can begin maybe with uh just uh some questions to you howie about um the godzilla project and um you know it was something that i i moved to new york in 2017 and um found uh you know was kind of hungry for any kind of spaces that would talk about both asian american art um or art and asian american kind of ideas and um a lot of those conversations kind of would reference some kind of mythical group like Godzilla. Um, and obviously it kind of had an undercurrent to what a lot of is going on today. Um, and so, you know, learning about and hearing about and being able to page through a document like this with the kind of original um, kind of scans and prints like really was a, a really kind of exciting thing to be able to see and kind of trace a lineage for um, oneself in, in that way. And so maybe I wondered, Howie, if you wanted to um, maybe mention, talk a bit about how your own relation to this kind of um, the Asian American cultural position, like how you, when you moved, to, when you moved to New York and like whether you avoided it or how you found it or you sought it out. Um, yeah, I wonder how you thought about that. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> I think um, this, you know, this Godzilla project really put together a lot of questions I had. Um, also, to put in context, a lot of the encounters I had with um, Asian American arts administrators uh, moving through the art the art scene in New York City. I came here um, into uh, to New York around '99, and um, I decided to to uh, pursue an abstract involvement in, in contemporary arts. Um, and I started doing a series of internships. Um, one of my first internships that I was lucky to, to be able to um, land was, was with Eugenie Tsai at the Whitney Museum. She was then um, at the, the, the museum on Madison Avenue. And, um, and throughout my experience uh, with working with um, Eugenie and also encountering um, Lydia Yi uh, down the line at the Whitney Independent Study Program, um, and then later on um, encountering Karen Higo, who became really um, influential um, to me as, as a friend and also, um, a, you know, an example of how to how to engage on different registers of of art and art history and community. Um, so I had some sense that you know you know, that there was this mythical history called Godzilla. I, I knew that it was founded in 1990 um, by artists and, and curators and writers, and that it had a, a long um, kind of, uh, had a long tail of, of its effects in terms of advocating for the visibility and representation, representation of Asian Americans in the art field, uh, among other things. Um, I knew that you know, the 90s was a, was a multicultural mo mo moment in which not only um, Black, Brown, um, uh, art, 
people of color, artists of color, we're, we're pushing for representation and inclusion. Um, so when, when um, this book project, the idea of it came around, and, um, and we can get into the details of it, it was um, a good opportunity for me to put together kind of the context of the people I encountered who I knew had a history in Godzilla, but also to understand the historical and material circumstances in which uh, Godzilla and their involvement um, existed in the 90s and how that connected even further back. Um, so, um, and it also connected what, what I was interested in too. I, I didn't come to um, New York to, you know, um, I guess my interest in contemporary art was a little bit more broad and then started taking on um, valences of identity and um, mm. crit critical uh, considerations. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting to hear. Um, it reminds me too of like um, when I arrived to New York in 2017 as well, and I also, you know, I um, was doing a year-long fellowship at the Brooklyn Museum, and didn't know who Eugenie Sai was at the beginning of it, but uh, kind of understood more of who she was by by the end of it. Um, but um, how uh, both of us, you know, arrived to Chinatown um, by way and then found our way into these histories and were kind of attracted to them in different ways. Like, um, despite, I don't know, I, you meet a lot of different people who have different relations to Chinatown, right? Like uh, people who are born here and raised here um, or people who, you know, are born elsewhere and raised and then find their way into, into that history. Um, and it reminds me of, I think the first time we actually met, um, at least as I remember it, I don't know if you remember it, <laughs> um, but uh, at the Gallery 47 Canal, um, when um, this art fashion collective CFGNY by Daniel Chu and Tin Nguyen had, were hosting a kind of series of, of talks, which I think I only ended up being like one basically of, of um, conversations on just, uh, Asian American identity and it, I remember being really fresh to New York and a friend <laughs> taking me to this gallery and it was you and um, people like you know Annika Yi and Josh Klein and um, Margaret Lee and feeling like I was like oh my god wow I had no idea a world or discourse like this um, existed um, but I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I do and I think that is also fresh for all of us too I think you know having gone through let's say I'm thinking about you know, the, the sketching out of the 90s and into the present that, you know, um, the 90s was a time of uh, really a, a focus on particularities such as identity. And I think the early 2000s, I would, I would categorize as the pendulum swinging to the, the universal, universal or universal claims. Um, mm -hmm. So I think by the time you came to New York, um, and, and I think when you walked into that conversation, I think a, a lot of us were, um, you know, feeling the pendulum swinging, you know, in a different direction where we, we there's a new fresh lens on to look, to look at um, identity um, using the new newer tools um, and also kind of uh, even being self-critical about um, the tools that we inherited uh, in terms of um, what came through multiculturalism and how that uh, filtered into what we now know as the diversity inclusion and, and, and um, initiatives. Um, so um, yeah, I think also it was also taking stock of seeing um, people of color in management roles, you know, in, in museums and also in the creative field and, and you know, like the, the to, to really kind of recalibrate, um, you know, uh, what binaries still apply, whether institutions versus you know the David yeah. Goliath kind of uh, narrative still exists or if we had to kind of figure out new ways of creating solidarity and, re and um, resistance to xyz mm. yeah and I mean that it brings me kind of you know partly we were brainstorming the title of this conversation right anarchic visibility and it came from you know conversations that we've had around um thinking about kind of the long game of, of Godzilla and even um, the kind of context of 
and the limits of, of representational politics, right? Um, how um, within your essay, um, you talk about how, you know, today there's kind of near parity in some cultural institutions um, with the demographic of Asian Americans in the US to positions within these spaces. And yet um, uh, the depth of kind of problems within these institutions has, has never been just um, of faces, right? As, as Godzilla knew, as, as you point out. And um, it's interesting to see how that played out across the lives of Godzilla members themselves and to observe, you know, as you mentioned yourself, you know, this tension between um, kind of a separatism and a kind of uh, kind of institutional internal kind of change. And obviously it's kind of a mixture of both to do both, but um, I wondered, uh, yeah, if you wanted to speak a bit more about this theme to anarchic visibility or what comes after representation. Yeah, I do remember us batting back and forth kind of um, titles, you know, what would, <laughs> what would what would we actually tune in, you know, in, in the landscape of of hashtag Asian something something, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think like to, to back up, I think I approach this, the Godzilla book and the Godzilla research um, through a few lenses. Um, of course, uh, I, I one of the lenses was um, a personal interest in in my encounters and making sense of of you know real life uh, relationships with people from that legacy and uh, history. Um, but I also was interested um, in Godzilla as, as a case study to look at uh, my interest in um, institutional critique, the critique of institutions, of museums, the art market. Um, of uh, academia, you know, the way they've, they've framed the say identity issues concerning Asian Asian Americans and, 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 and marginalized peoples. Um, the other lens that I was interested in and what you just mentioned, mentioned is the sociology of, of uh, Asian American and, and um, or identity-based um, art efforts and organizing, you know, kind of the stories that, that we, we, we come to know and, and, and how, um, how positions, I think those critical positions play out over time and how institutions, you know, um, figure into that, that, that landscape and how they absorb, let's say critical demands, um, whether it's individual demands or collective demands and how that is manifested and how we have to recalibrate a criticality, you know, in the face of, of co-option. Uh, co um, so all that to say, I think what I, I was thinking about it today was like, I was really, I feel like I was, I was interested in sketching out a left, a, a kind of a, a left perspective on um, Asian American art discourse, you know, and having, not, not just for the sake of, of, of flying the flag for that position, but really to be able to, to kind of sort out, you know, the discursive field, you know, what is what is dominating, um, let's say, identity discourse institutionally, you know, um, which not, um, a lot of that, a lot of times that's uh, I feel like it's um, um, centrist liberal discourse um, that's that's you know that's taking the, the kind of middle ground. And I think a lot of times that, that's conflated with um, radical histories and maybe perhaps liberal uh, left demands. And I think like at, at this point, um, I think everybody's searching for complexity and difference in, in this space of, of, uh, of, um, of progress. So, um, so with, um, with the book um, I, and especially with the intro, I really wanted to kind of sketch the differences and, and, almost, and also um, to really, you'll see in the intro and I'll post a link to it. I, I made a PDF of it for those who aren't able to access the book. You'll see that I, I, I take a great um, pains to, to not only sketch out the history, but also to, to create, to be able to re arrive at the critiques um, that have occurred um, in specific instances with the Whitney Biennial, um, Dana Schutz uh, painting controversy or the, the MOCA controversy that the critiques um, have a context and that a lot of times um, the critiques are imminent to the discourse that 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 um, started from the radical demands of the '60s uh, in terms of these mm -hmm. these kind of movements. Um, so that's I don't know. That's kind of um, 
who how I'm thinking about this whole thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that makes sense. There's like at least two, like it seems, you know, a recent re-media interest around, you know, Asian American issues spurred by, you know, terrible attacks and and then also from that, you know, kind of new articulations of those questions in essays like, you know, Kathy Park Hong and Jay Caspian Kang and um, kind of a, a complication of uh, the term Asian American, right? And um, a further complication of it, I guess. And, um, you know, part of it even of uh, really trying to uh, take more of what you're saying of the kind of absorbing more of the sort of liberal or the progressive radical kind of critique of identity and and also applying it to a very practical kind of way so in the sense that like say just jay caspian kang right uh a lot of his writing centers around uh the kind of class disparities that exist within the term asian american and how it might uh you know it makes it very difficult to kind of lump together someone who might be like a, a Uyghur refugee and then like a, a, a boba liberal <laughs> all like under the same kind of umbrella. And I think um, one of the most interesting things about Godzilla too was that um, it was a kind of fast and loose kind of understanding of this term Asian American um, where uh, it was a kind of temporary suspension of its complexity in order to kind of accomplish some things, right? You know, like obviously essentialization is is part of identity um, to an extent, right? It's what happens when that is carried on beyond its utility, right? And, and that it becomes a jail of sorts. So I always thought that was interesting within the, that's one of the things I think about in the legacy of Godzilla. It's like this group of people who like probably had tons of things that were pulling them apart, um, but decided to, you know, intentionally kind of gather around this loose idea of Asian American. Yeah, I think I, I I also um yeah I, I'm I'm also interested in um, disaggregating or like looking at how one can disaggregate uh, the Asian American category as as an essential identity um, and I I, I also um, am interested in the the type of pressures um, kind of uh, structural pressures that would create uh, a, a identity that that people um, would would uh, identify in term politically, but also perhaps on a, on a vibe level. Like you know, I'm thinking about like you know, like Kathy Park Kong is like really about the type type of uh, you know the the actual kind of feeling to to really recognize the the psych the psychic uh, uh, experience of racialization. You know, but at the same time balancing with the kind of an understanding of its construction. And I think, like you said, I think, you know, um, I, I was just putting together a list, you know, when, when we talk about anarchic, like Godzilla being anarchic, yes, you know, the structure of Godzilla um, was uh, was a flat structure in terms of how how it was, was run, you know, it was consensus run and there wasn't a, a particular leader. Um, but I th also think it embodied kind of the, um, an anarchic kind of identity, uh, Ethic in, in, um, in that yes, everybody can um, uh, can sign a letter as Asian Americans, an open letter as Asian Americans, um, uh, demanding representation, um, demanding um, you know uh, access to institutions and, and um, uh, inclusion and discourse, um, but at the same time within within that within that umbrella there are people who are involved in a, a, like a plethora of, of different um, uh, other organizations that are, have different configurations of identity you know I'm just a few like gorilla girls pests heresies coast to coast women of color um, apicha act up uh, gays in Pacific Island of uh, Gapimni, uh, cav, um, all these other ways of identifying. And I think like when we were thinking about um, this, even the title of this, this uh, talk, we were thinking about like what it means when we invoke anarchic identities. It means like really kind of dismantling the hierarchies of identity where, you know, like that there are ways of contingently identifying um, um, without kind of uh, privileging one over the other uh, as, as being essential, like, you know, um, 
So I think, yeah, I think that that might be a takeaway that I think is often kind of uh, obscured by the, the bigger story about, um, you know, uh, Godzilla, uh, Godzilla's big wins, which is like kind of like protesting the Whitney and uh, the mm -hmm. professional, the professional wins. I think it's really the, it's really the, the details that I think that only through maybe the documents and through yeah. um, a complex look at these histories, whether it's basement workshop or, or you know, uh, or Godzilla um, can reveal um, more than just the, the kind of um, big trophy <laughs> uh, yeah. take homes. You know? I mean, that's why the meeting minutes are so juicy. That um, constitutes a lot of the the book of, um, yeah, of just being able to see how they were hopping from apartment to apartment, and you know who was going to cook next time, and um, how they were very much a group of, of friends, you know, as you uh, as you say, as as well as a group of, of people who admired each other and um, uh, kind of. Uh, we're supporting one another in different ways from being art historians to artists to curators and things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about um, uh, your write up in book form of, 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 the, of uh, the Godzilla book. Uh, you really honed in on um, the tension that maybe was embodied in the, the first few years, uh, the, the hopes and dreams of, of Godzilla of Godzilla in the minutes. There, there was this, this idea of um, how, um, cultural autonomy could be achieved, whether it is through a national museum or, or um, uh, ha having your own critics, ha uh, creating your own history. Um, I'm curious about um, how you zone in on that aspect of it. And is it, does it, is it more a reflection of what's, what's happening now? Yeah, um, I think, uh, it was interesting to observe, um, you know, with the kind of uh, perspective of time, uh, everything from the inception to its ending to the eventual careers of, of many of of all the of the members of Godzilla, right? And um, how I'm sure, as as you have too, felt the kind of pulls of of different ways of sustaining oneself within a cultural field, um, but also of working within and outside of institutions. And, um, you know, uh, I think the initial energy was so interesting to me because I always think about, um, you know, of a corollary, which is maybe not the best corollary, but like the Studio Museum in Harlem, right? And like, what it would have looked like in those initial conversations when Godzilla thought about like, oh, maybe we'll do a museum. And they were like, actually, no, we're all artists. Like, we don't really want to do that. Um, but that dream today, because it feels um, that there's such a, an urgent want and need from this generation for um, different models of arranging philanthropy, um, you know, corporate structure, um, a bureaucratic structure in a way that doesn't replicate um, a lot of the violences that people are protesting against, right? And and, and and in Godzilla, it was like, okay, well, a lot of people um, eventually went on to become very successful artists and, and, and have lots of exposure and then also become curators at the institutions they protested at. And um, it's uh, that initial energy that is kind of like a hanging question in the air, right? Like, of 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 what if and 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 what now? You know, like uh, what? Uh, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it I would mean. <laughs> yeah, I think you know. I think about. Yeah, I think that energy is very much still there. Like you know, I I think it's just in, embodied in different ways. I think right now, um, like, I'm thinking about uh, Mocha. You know the you know um what the history of mocha and how it was constituted you know starting with uh, a prehistory in the basement workshop you know i think they were also thinking about this idea of having an institution you know fubu for us by us uh, you know like style um and how you know the, the hopes and desires uh went into building an institution and a collection uh, that constitutes the institution now um uh, with the, the, uh, the idea of that institution serving the community 
and reflecting uh, discourse and be able to, to kind of radiate um, the culture and the cultural production uh, uh, outwards beyond, uh, you know, <laughs> into other spaces and discursive spaces. Um, I think, I think the hopes and dreams of having an institution to be to be accountable, responsible um, is still there. And I think, um, and, and very much, I think that is there to reform institutions like the uh, MOCA, the you know Whitney, Guggenheim, you know all these institutions. So it's not. I think it's not endemic to just Asian America. Um, I think it's it's definitely a crisis of liberal cultural institutions that they need mm -hmm. to be accountable to um, communities to be able to count, be accountable to symbolic and economic and carceral violence that they may, you know, that they may be entwined um, with. Um, that includes uh, funding structures and, and, and mm -hmm. um, governance, governance too. So I think, um, I think it's, I think, I, I don't know if they'll come in the form of a cultural museum, um, but I think uh, it, 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 it is materialized in, in kind of, um, uh, whether it's protests or through discur other discursive means, such as this book, uh, you know, at, or this conversation, or and I think you know, Margot emailed me um, just a few days ago. Margot Machida, you know, the founder of Godzilla, and, um, and she was underlying the fact that you know, within academia and institution institutions, these are all platforms in which people are doing the work. Uh, you know, yeah. sure there are there are people who are there, there to do other things, but you know, there are people who are using those platforms to transform discourse or to create, um, you know, um, and be there for new meaning productions and, and, and sites of, um, you know, uh, yeah, other intersections with, with other things. So, uh, um, yeah, I yeah, I think that's, I, so I'm curious, so I'm interested in what it means does that kind of vibe with what you're thinking about or the landscape that you're seeing? Well, yeah, I mean, definitely. I feel like, uh, yeah, the way Godzilla very, you know, literally lives on in the continued kind of ways of keeping institutions accountable, right? And like the, the mocha boycott and things like that. And, um, and that spirit, um, is uh, invested in a lot of organizations today. And um, it was interesting to hear you say that uh, Asian American Arts Alliance is the, was the fiscal sponsor for, for um, uh, Godzilla only. I, I think we, I mentioned I work with this organization called the Racial Imaginary Institute. And it was kind of this like roving collective that was founded by the poet Claudia Rankine. And it also goes into existing institutional spaces and. Um, creates programming around race and identity. And um, as I've become more involved with them, we've also, uh, you know, found a fiscal sponsor and like that very specific, I guess, kind of niche nonprofit um, architecture was is, is, in, is interesting to see. Um, so it looks like we have yeah, five there's minutes. so much. To, oh, wow. So there's <laughs> so much to talk about because um, I wanted to ask you, um, I've been, I was really interested in your recent curatorial project. Um, and this is, speaks more to, to our um, Anarchic Identities uh, title. Um, you curated a, um, an exhibition at David Zwerner um, of uh, an artist who's passed, uh, his name is Ching Ho Chang. Um, he was a New York based artist. He was ethnically Chinese, born in Cuba, and he practiced art in the 70s and 80s. Um, Besides being a really striking exhibition, um, I was really interested in the text that you wrote for it and how you, from my perspective, I'm, I'm sensitive to that, the way you kind of um, uh, construct, kind of um, contingently um, arranged how identity um, connects to his practice. Um, and, um, and, if you look at the if you look at the text, people I really recommend um, people reading it. Uh, you start out with kind of like the, the formal qualities of the work and his biography. Um, um, but you enter his work from you know n not necessarily I Asian American identity first. Um, you look at it through a kind of ecology of identities, including um, 
queer identity as being one of them. And I'm, I just wanted to kind of hear as a practicing curator, um, kind of like the thinking that goes behind that when we're thinking about anarchic identities, how like, um, how do you, was that that kind of push and pull or the kind of um, maybe the flattening of and creating an ecology of a different identities? Is that, is that what you had in mind? Yeah, definitely. I was very conscious of it in the sense that, um, you know, you could go to Chelsea now and I think there are a couple shows up as we speak around Asian American identity. And um, I was approached about this show last May um, as part of a larger umbrella of shows that was called More Life. Um, that was to mark the 40th anniversary of the first diagnosed case of HIV AIDS in the US and um, was a series of solo shows that um, were kind of considering the work of lesser known artists who had, had passed from AIDS in some way or another. And, you know, even the circumstances of being asked were riven with identity or was like, oh, you are queer and Asian American. He is queer and Asian American. Um, and, um, and I was, you know, happy to do it. And then like conscious of that immediately already going into the project. Um, and what I felt, you know, I worked very closely with the sister, Sibo Chang Wilson of Ching Ho Chang. And what I, um, what came across was to be as sensitive to the uh, kind of conditions of identity that um, Ching might have worked through um, as possible in the sense that he was born in 1946. He moved to New York in like the 60s and, you know, passed in 89 and was largely operated in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it was very revealing when, and in a very early draft of the essay, which I shared with Sibo, she was really taken aback by the use of the word queer, where she was like, oh, you know, this is a term that um, was so derogatory for so long growing up. And it kind of just gave me this um, vision into, you know, just how um, time specific identity terminology can be right from the 90s and, and until now in this particular way of, of marking people. And so I guess um, that's what felt um, important to me in the framing of the show was not to lop a 2021 vision of how he would have interpreted himself directly onto it because there's kind of a bit of flexibility and possibility in these prior formulations of identity. Um, and what I connected it to and today was this kind of idea around um, queer e ecology or something that is, I guess, inspired by work like Annika Yi or, or Tiffany Shin and the writings of Anna K. Singh, The Mushroom at the End of the World, uh, or, or Mel Chin, uh, The uh, Animacies, where um, kind of in this gridlock of uh, kind of semantic and human-based identity politics, like there's this interest in looking beyond into something uh, beyond human that like, you know, what, what is male or female if you are like a cell or like a, um, I don't know, a mitochondria or a tree. Um, so uh, that kind of openness uh, around a kind of representation of oneself or an anarchic identity, I think is, is something that a lot of people are exploring today that I'm interested in and that I saw glimpses of in, in Ching's work, I guess. Yeah, I think, you know, we just uh, published a round table in November magazine with um, Paul Pfeiffer and Tommy Arai and we talk about um, how hegemonic identity identity is, you know, like just as you were talking about how how um, our you know queer the queer queer label is very so time specific and that you know like how can we be um, aware of that and, and be able to kind of like to make sure that we we're able to kind of be able to be historical <laughs> about, about identity but also to to be able to um, for lack of a better word be more anarchic about uh, you know, or at least be critical about the kind of hegemonic identities that were that are presented to us, you know, at this time, at this time and space. Um, <laughs> um, maybe I, I, I don't want to, I know we're, um, we're, there's so much more to talk about, but I'd love to, there's so many great people that are participating. I'd love to open it up to, to discussion and questions. Um, I don't know um, if we, this moderator or people can kind of beam in and, and chat with us. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for that conversation. So first we're going to, um, we're gonna announce the winner of the uh, anthology um, 
Priscilla is going to draw the names with the um, wheel of names here. So everybody who has signed up uh, has wow. been entered in there. So we'll give it a spin and uh, let's see who we, who's gonna be the, our lucky winner. It looks like Arlen. Oh, Arlen. Arlen. Arlen Wong. Another copy. Awesome. Congratulations. So speaking of Arlen Wong, um, we have, I think, about 10, maybe 10 members of Godzilla on, um, on, on the call today. So um, some of you may want to just say hi and wave and let us know that you're here. And others may want to open yourself up to participate in the Q&A. Um, so if you want to say hi, um, you know, just uh, you can raise your hand. We see you, Helen. Um, and, <laughs> um, and if you want to stay and participate, um, you can turn your camera on and Priscilla will spotlight you. So, oh, Dorothy, okay, you're under Asian American Buddhist. Okay, um, great. So I see you there. So um, I know, let's see. So uh, Dion is here, Tamia, if you wanna say hi, um, we know you're here, Shelly is here, um, Sung Ho, Arlen, we mentioned you, So Juan, Kwan, we know you're here. Um, Margo, the legendary Margo Machida is here. Um, Athena um, and Lynn Yamamoto, I know. If I missed anybody, I'm very, very sorry. Um, but we'd love it if you would turn your cameras on and um, yay, great, fantastic. Um, oh, hello, Hi, hello. Hi, Let's Dorothy, see. wow. I'm gonna um, change to a gallery view. So fantastic, Margo and Dorothy. Um, anybody else? Nobody else wants to say hi from mm -hmm. Godzilla and, and share? Um, no pressure. <laughs> Arlen, awesome. Welcome, Arlen. We're happy to have you. Um, so I, I understand, I know that there was, you know, obviously there was a, a launch at Artist Space, um, but there hasn't really been an online forum for us to talk to you all, um, for you to, I mean, I'm sure many of you talked to Howie, but some of you might not have been able to attend um, the, the book launch at, at Artist Space. So we're very happy that you're here. Um, you can unmute yourself if you wish to chat, but um, I, yeah, I'm going to field the questions from um, the audience. So if people want to just drop your questions or just say hi in the chat, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can um, just pop your questions in there. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, and you're welcome to join us if you want, Helen. Um, <laughs> don't be shy. Hi, Shelly. We're glad that you're here too. Um, thanks. Oh, Charles. Great, great, great. Um, it's so nice to see all of you all here. Yes, definitely. We want more faces. There's a, a request for more faces. Um, <laughs> we should take a screenshot too. Um, oh. but yeah, yeah uh, please drop in questions. Um, I. You know, for a long time, it was just me and a computer and a scanner um, working. And so to be able to talk to people about the book or answer any questions, um, it's, it's so trippy for me to see the book out there uh, in the world, uh, material form. But um, I, I really like, yeah, the dialogue that it's producing. Um, I just want to say, Howie, thank you so much for all the work you've done. I mean, it's monumental. And... Uh, you know, the way that you've been able to draw out some of the complexities of Godzilla's history. Um, and as you say, it's all in the details. I mean, I, I think it really, it's really a powerful collection in that way. And thank you, really. So thank you. I, I'm gonna mute uh, myself again. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I, Simon and I um, share that we're not Asian Americanists and we're, you know, so I feel like, um, I really, I really approached this project as a curator. So I was really trying to synthesize, you know, as much as I could of what I understand about Asian American discourse, Asian American his, art history, um, uh, you know, um, 
yeah, the like movement work, uh, you know, and also just you know the, the short history of the Asian American art movement that you've been working on, Mar Margot, for so long. Um, so yeah, I was doing my best to be able to to synthesize what I was coming what I was coming across, and, and um, to also throw in my perspective um, in the process. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, can I. Oh. I just want to actually I want to ask Simon a question. Um, you know, Simon, it was really interesting to read uh, the piece in let me see his book form, and I thought that I mean I actually had two questions, and one of them was about what you were kind of calling the tension between separatism and assimilationism, as you saw these as like different tendencies within Godzilla, and I thought it was interesting kind of framework, because I'm not really sure, I mean, is it really strong separatism for Godzilla to come together in this really loose umbrella as an Asian, you know, with some, some notion of Asian Americanness? However, you know, and I don't think we, we ever had one definitive idea of that. Um, so I, I don't know if Godzilla was a separatist, I mean, if that was the orientation. Um, so I, I, I guess that was just a question. And then the other one has to do with whether working in institutions necessarily is assimilationist. I, I think that all these sites are sites of struggle. And for those of us who've been, in my case, I worked in both, like in museums and in university. And I think that um, we continuously battle being seen as boutique subjects, being seen as marginal, um, that even though we have not, we have more numbers at this point, I'm not really sure that that I would necessarily consider that assimilationist. And then I guess the third thing is just I'm not sure that Godzilla's focus is necessarily identitarian. You know, was was it really identity politics? I I, I think that. By the time Godzilla came on the scene, the discourses around globalization, around global diaspora, around this notion of the sort of the oceanic that how I was talking about, you know, lateral identities and multiple connections was something that actually is, is basement was also about that in my view. I mean, I had limited exposure, but I worked with Fei Chang and it was really quite profound. I mean, Arlen, I know your history is much deeper than mine around this. But, you know, so I just wanted to raise those as issues. Yeah, thank you so much for reading and, and those questions too. I, I guess um, I was reflecting on um, what is, you know, maybe that I pose in too much of a binary because um, those are impulses that I guess run through anyone who is a sort of cultural worker in, in the field where you have to decide, you know, what kind of jobs you're going to take versus what sort of things that you want to accomplish. Um, and um, I think I saw it as separatism, not necessarily in the sense of it trying to pry itself away from uh, cultural discourse, but um, in the sense that um, in its very structure and the bones of something being kind of non-hierarchical and like network-like and spread, it was very different than um, how a traditional museum might be organized. And so in that way, I found it to be that Godzilla was modeling through existence, a kind of way of being that would be different than museums. And um, I think you know the sustainability or the longevity of that type of format is something that has to be navigated uh, through uh, existing within capitalism, right? And like finding funding structures and 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 feeding into that. So um, that was kind of the uh, tension that I was interested in was that this kind of ability to construct a new organization, but um, that new organization, you know capitalism being kind of hostile to the existence of that organization, right? Where like the funding structures and things are not set up in the way that can sustain that kind of organization for over long, long periods of time um, and, and achieve the kind of perhaps uh, platform or, or visibility that um, was uh, interested in. And so those are, those are kind of the first two questions. I don't know if I answered um, all of them. 
can I chime in also? I think, um, you know, I think I, I was also interested in this issue and I, I think I framed it maybe different in different terms in terms of like autonomy and institutionalization, you know, instead of, um, instead of separatism and, and assimilation. So, um, so I was interested in not so much that, you know, people just, you know, just assimilate and go into <laughs> whatever, uh, you know, uh, process cheese mush of the institution, but I, I'm interested in how, um, you know, how institutions are able to absorb the demands, um, you know, uh, uh, of identitarian demands, um, uh, justice demands, um, and reflect that back in ways that seem to neutralize the, the original kind of intent. Um, so I think I, I, I did also hone in on the, the first few meeting minutes, one, the first one being at, at your studio about, um, the, you know, like, uh, I think both um, Bingley and um, Ken Chu were talking about, wouldn't it be great to have our own museum? Wouldn't it be great to have our own library? Wouldn't it be great to be able to to curate our own library the way we want to. And I think that's maybe not so much separatist, but it's a type of autonomy, I think that we we look for on the horizon um, and that you know, how that maybe becomes compromised for, through, through kind of real reality, <laughs> you know, and, and um, institutional kind of uh, impossibilities too. Um, but when with the Godzilla came down to nobody really wanted to run an institution or a museum, which is kind of also radical and stuff is not necessarily abolitionist, but I think it, it, it speaks to uh, maybe a, a resistance to, uh, or the understanding that institutions may reify in ways that um, people don't want to take be complicit with. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that's that's what the zone that I was I was kind of into. I'm, I guess I'm also thinking of um, orgs that have sprung up in the course of the pandemic, like public assistance, um, which is just like a queer kind of a space run by artists in Crown Heights um, that is also trying to reimagine what like funding structures look like and, and what um, a nonprofit structure looks like. Um, and in that sense, uh, and the legacy of what, um, how he was talking about institutional critique, right? And how, um, critique of institutions like, um, you know, weds you to the object of your critique in a weird, unhappy marriage. Um, and where something like institutional indifference or kind of like um, agnosticism even around like trying to form these new um, things is an energy that I feel like I identify with today. And that's kind of why I was drawn to it in the Godzilla um, historical presentation. Um, I just wanted to say, I think Dorothy, you had a question that you were going to pose or something you wanted to say before. I just wanted to uh, say that I remember Margo always telling me in those days, you don't exist unless you're documented. And so now, Margo, we're documented. <laughs> I love that double entendre of that too. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, uh, so I, there was a question from Ginger Brooks Takahashi on um, the uh, the got the G11, G10, G19 um, withdrawal of the uh, from the exhibition at MOCA, the Godzilla exhibition. Um, so uh, I don't know Ginger if the members of um, Godzilla want to talk about it. We have like we're, yeah. we're kind of at time, but I think it's a important yeah. question. If you want to, um, if anybody wants to share that process, yeah, or yeah, I think like I just want to say that more than a. Yeah, it's really complicated and you know as you know it's a tender subject I think um, I'll just answer real quickly and Arlen is here too maybe he wants to respond I the, I think the mechanics of of the protests um, starting with the initial inquiry into um, Mocha's um, uh, situation with the jail plan um, is kind of um, doc, uh, document or at least described in um, the interview uh, I guess an interview with the with G10 in art form and um, and I think that's really, I think it goes into detail into kind of like the way in which you, you engage um, institution and um, the, the, the lines of communication that, that everybody is trying to, to create um, dialogue in. So uh, Arlen, yeah, I, I'm interested in time. Is there anything, since you're here, you wanna chime in? Yeah, I think it's a very complicated situation. And I think you touch upon um, uh, the issues, Howie, in your book. 
And I also would like to say that, you know, part of the, um, the, the protests of, of, of MOCA actually stems from um, uh, the difference between Basement Workshop and Godzilla. And part of that difference is what you were talking about, the, uh, uh, or, or as Simon says, the separatists. Uh, coming from, from Basement, there is a thread um, which, which is uh, more third world. Um, I mean, I always characterized it as uh, uh, from the Chris and Charlie song, uh, Joanne song. Um, we don't want a piece of your pie. We want to bake our own. So I think that's the thread that comes from basement. Uh, Godzilla I always thought was, um, we want a piece of your pie. We don't necessarily want to bake our own. Um, so there's, there's the difference in the threads. Um, so that carries through to today to, uh, in, in the MOCA issue. But it's complicated. It, sh it should be, we could deal with it at another time. But also, I would like to throw my book back into the, uh, into the ring and, and give it to someone else. So Priscilla, please roll, roll the dice again. That's very kind, Arlen. Priscilla, you want to you wanna give the wheel another spin? Yeah, sure. Um, hopefully they're still here. <laughs> this is like when Oprah gives away a car, right? <laughs> and you get a book and you get a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. All right. Um, oh, the one is no longer here. Um, so I, well, We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, we can follow up with someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the, one, the one thing I want to uh, underline is that, you know, the book is structured going into the present. So even though the title is just a decade long, you know, not just a decade, it's amazing that an organization stayed together for 10 years. But if you look at the chronology, it goes all the way up until uh, as, as present as possible up to, um, the G something's letter to um, MoMA about Warren Canders, uh, you know, being on the board. So I think I, I just want to underline that, that there is this history, but also a living history of, of that is still creating discourse. Um, and even if you pull the camera back on the MUCA situation, in the recent past of all museum protests, um, and this is something in which the press would, would kind of lock on, and it's like that. This is one that actually kind of precipitated um, the institution to, you know, have to negotiate whether they're going to have an exhibition or not. And, you know, and I think mm -hmm. um, and you, with MoMA or any other, they were able to navigate around, um, you know, find loopholes and, and to, to, you know, um, main, have it both ways. And I think, um, I think that historically is very important. I don't know if that will ever get kind of historicized in a way, but I think in terms of the most recent protests um, against uh, cultural institutions, I think that was a major thing. Thanks, Howie. I think that's a really important note um, to go out on, um, looking at the future, um, even as Simon said, like this, uh, you know, institutions uh, continue to be influenced today um, by Godzilla and it touches on so many groups um, like public assistance and many others. So um, as you said, we could talk on and on and on about a million different aspects of Godzilla's uh, lasting legacy. And I hope that we'll have the opportunity um, to do so again. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here. So generous of your time. And I wanna thank you, Howie and Simon, um, and especially all of our Godzilla family who's here today. Thank you for, um, for joining us. And hopefully we can uh, continue to contribute to the discourse and uh, uplift our visibility. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Howie. Thank you to everyone. At, Thank uh, you, everyone. Hey. Hi, Shelley.